but that won't last. Um, today is, uh, I think it's class 15 of 32 classes, which will actually be 34, 35. Um, today's the first part of the uh, Mahadukkha Kanda Sutta. Uh, the second part will be Tuesday. And then right after retreat, we're, we're going to have two weeks on the Kula Dukkha Kanda Sutta, the lesser discourse on Dukkha, but it's uh, no less important. Um, last week, uh, what's today? It's uh, last Tuesday. Uh, our sutta was on the Dukkha Sutta, where the Buddha, where Sariputta teaches the three forms of stress of Dukkha. There's the, the stress of bodily pain, or really the stress of simply having a human body. The stress of fabrications, which is both the stress of mental difficulties or a troubled mind, but also the ongoing stress of living within a fabricated view of self. That ultimately the, the Dhamma resolves in within the self and, and going from a fabricated view of reality rooted in ignorance of Four Noble Truths to developing understanding. And that leads directly to uh, today's sutta. Um, Dukkha means stress, suffering, disappointment, unsatisfactory life experiences, uh, minor pain, all the way up to extreme forms of suffering. It's all part of Dukkha. And it's all part of having a human life. That second part of the title of today's sutta, next week's Kanda, uh, speaks directly to the five clinging aggregates. In other words, Dukkha occurs within what the Buddha describes as the ongoing personal experience of suffering as five clinging aggregates form, feeling, perceptions, mental fabrications, and ongoing thinking rooted in ignorance of Four Noble Truths. And that all points to how we resolve this. Another word for clinging aggregates in the old Pali and Sanskrit language was khanda, K-H-A-N-D-A, or skanda, it means the same thing. And that translate, translates into um, a heap, can be a, a khanda, khanda means a heap, or even the root of a tree. And when you look at it in the right context as five clinging aggregates, these five clinging aggregates are, in the Buddha's words, would often refer to suffering this way, the whole mass of suffering. It's, it's part of this heap that we call me, mine, ours, what we take ownership of. And that is the central theme that we're looking at during these 32 classes, is that it resolves within ourselves these wrong views. Um, Today's sutta answers a question that the Sangha had. What's the differentiating characteristic between what the Buddha teaches and basically what everybody else was teaching? And it re resolves in an understanding of suffering. And actually, the, we, we touched briefly on this earlier. Much of modern Buddhism and much of the modern world teaches us that we should embrace or join with our suffering. And we do this through analysis, through aggrandizing or over um, emphasizing ordinary suffering and making it something more simply by delving into it and so-called joining with it or exploring it or looking for insight in it. The Buddha said, recognize stress and suffering for what it is. It's rooted in ignorance. Let it go. <clears throat> Don't mess around with it. It's a conda. It's a heap of stuff. The other reference to kanda is the uh, kanda could mean the root of a tree. And the reference then is that all suffering is rooted in this whole mass of suffering, dukkha kanda. So. <clears throat> on one occasion, the Maha Dukkha Kanda Sutta, on one occasion, the Buddha was staying in Savati in Jita's Grove, Anatha Pandika's monastery. Early in the morning, a group of disciples adjusted their robes and carrying their bowls, their alms bowls, left for Savati. They quickly realized that it was too early for alms and decided to visit a group of wanderers from another sect. They exchanged courteous greetings and sat to one side. The wanderers from the other sect questioned the group from the Buddha Sangha. Friends, Gautama the Contemplative describes understanding sensuality as we do. Gautama describes understanding forms as we do. Gautama describes understanding feelings as we do. Friends, what is the difference, the distinguishing factor between his teaching and ours? An important point, huh? The Buddha's disciples, neither delighting nor disapproving of these words, decided to seek out their teacher to hear his words. They went for alms and then returned to the Buddha. 
They bowed to their teacher and sat to one side and told him what the wanderers of the other, other sect said. <coughs> the Buddha replied, friends, when wanderers of other sects say this to you, <coughs> you should ask them, what is the allure, the drawback, and the release with regards to sensuality? What is the allure, the drawback, and the release with regards to forms? What is the allure, the drawback, and the release with regards to feelings? In other words, he's asking, <clears throat> how do you get entangled with these? Not do you know what it is or you can describe it externally outside of yourself. Well, I stubbed my toe. There's dukkha. There's, that's all I need to know about dukkha. Or that person got me upset. That, that's dukkha. That's all I need to know. The Buddha is saying, understand how you get entangled with the world, entangled with dukkha. That's the important understanding, not to describe it. Anybody can describe it. When asked, these wanderers of other sects will be in trouble and will not be able to provide a reasonable answer. This understanding is simply beyond their knowledge. And of course, if you don't strive to understand something, you shouldn't be expected to know it. Friends, in the world of fabricated divas, <coughs> maras, and brahmas, of contemplative and brahmins, um, brahma is the overarching Hindu god, not to get too deep into it, and brahmins are the priests in that Hindu religion. Royalty and commoners. I do not see anyone who could answer these questions aside from myself, my disciples, or someone who learned my Dhamma from a skillful disciple. <clears throat> this next section is called Understanding the Allure, the Drawback, and the Release of Clinging to Sensuality. The Buddha continues, now what is the allure of sensuality? There are five clinging fabrications of sensuality, forms interpreted by the eyes as agreeable, pleasing, endearing, and enticing, sounds interpreted by the ears as agreeable, pleasing, endearing, and enticing, aromas interpreted by the nose as agreeable, pleasing, endearing, and enticing, flavors interpreted by the tongue as agreeable, pleasing, endearing, and enticing, tactile sensations interpreted by the body as agreeable, pleasing, entertaining, and enticing. So right there, the Buddha is describing the sixth sense base, actually five of the sixth sense base, but he's also pointing out where the Dhamma is practiced at the sixth sense base, at our interaction between the external world and the external world could also be a fabrication in our thoughts because we've externalized it and objectified it. And our thinking, our ongoing thinking. And so if our, at the point of contact, if our thinking is still rooted in ignorance of Four Noble Truths, this moment is going to simply reaffirm my ignorance, unless I have a framework of which to understand what's occurring in relation to the Four Noble Truths. Is that last statement understandable by everyone? Mm -hmm. At the point of contact. Mm -hmm. And so this points to the potential that each and every moment has for us as human beings. Remember, this is a, this is a Dhamma for human beings. If my mind is well concentrated and well framed, the refined mindfulness of holding in mind the Eightfold Path, then what is arising in this moment will be interpreted from right view and will contribute towards my awakening. If I'm still clinging to views rooted in ignorance of Four Noble Truths, no matter how sincere I might be on awakening or maybe just being a good, engaged, compassionate Buddhist, if my thinking is still rooted in ignorance, no matter what my motivation is for this moment, I can only continue ignorance. Why? Because no matter what I'm occurring, what, no matter what is occurring, I'm interpreting from a mind rooted in ignorance. It can only produce that same effect. That's the problem. That's what the Buddha awakened to. How can I pierce this veil of ignorance that is common to every human being? How can I get past that? Another way of asking it, how does a person that's deluded know that they're deluded? Think about it. How would you? If all of your thinking is rooted in that delusion, there's no vehicle for understanding and having that aha moment. That's where I'm ignorant of. That's what the Buddha grappled with after his awakening. And that's why he presented it in Eightfold Path, to frame our thinking so we can recognize our own ignorance at the point of contact, at the sixth sense base. That's clear? Yes? Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. I'm going to skip over some comments. The Buddha continues. Friends, whatever pleasure or happiness that one depends on, establishing through any of these five senses is the distracting allure of sensuality. 
whatever pleasure or happiness that one depends on, de that one depends on establishing through any of these five senses is a distracting <clears throat> allure of sensuality. There's so much in there that it can simply be overlooked. Whatever one depends on. So the question we ask ourselves, what am I depending on in this moment for my happiness? Because for most human beings, it's an endless list of things that are constantly coming up, grabbing our attention in the moment. And if it's something that I can address right now, meaning if can I increase my grasping right now, I'm going to do it and I'm going to be distracted. Why? Because my mind isn't rooted in concentration and doesn't know how to perceive what's occurring. Is that clear? Seriously, I, I it said a lot, is it? Because that's an important point. And again, in this moment, I'm either going to practice the Dhamma or I'm going to practice distraction. I'm either going to practice the Dhamma or I'm going to practice ignorance. I have a question, John. Is that would that be the same thing <clears> as, <throat> as, as wanting peace of mind? Boy, that's such a great question. Yeah. And it depends on intention. Mm -hmm. Because if our here's the eightfold path. Because if my intention is to be if my intention is simply to be a good human being, which is, we should, at the very basic, we should be mindful of being a good human being. Most of us are. But then we ask ourselves, how do we get into situations where individually I'm in conflict with people and nationally and internationally we're in conflict with other people? Where does it arise? Is it because, because of my political views? No, it's not. Is it because of my nationalism? No, it's not. Is it because I'm following one party or another? No. I'm contributing to conflict in the world because of my ignorance. And that's the only place that it can be resolved. Ignorance of Four Noble Truth. I, I think I missed it just a little bit, Mary. Yeah, because I mean, to me, peace of mind would mean regardless of what's going on around you. Yes. Um, you can be at peace with it whether you agree with it or disagree with it, yeah, you can still disagree with it, but it's happening, just, you know, it's happening. Yes. Yeah. The, um, the Buddha, te and this sutta speaks directly to it in these, this whole course of teachings. The Buddha teaches that right view, right understanding is a profound understanding of the first noble truth of stress and suffering. And he, he incorporates that description of awakened right view as he continues saying, right view understands the origination and the cessation of stress and suffering, meaning the origination and the cessation, excuse me, of ignorance. Right, right view, right view has a profound understanding of the cessation of stress and suffering. Right view has a profound understanding of the path leading to the cessation. So all four noble truths are included in right view. And when the Buddha is talking about understanding, he's talking about having a direct experience with it, not an intellectual experience. And that's what leads to a common peaceful mind, no matter what's, what's occurring in the world. We've learned the difference between acceptance and approval at a very profound level. We don't have to accept what's occurring in the world. In fact, acceptance really becomes um, an aspect of awakening. We simply accept what's occurring because it's what's occurring. It's only a troubled mind rooted in ignorance that would insist that what's occurring and what has already occurred be different than it is. It can't be. But a mind rooted in understanding understands where the, the difficulties in the world arise from. Not an individual person, not an individual group, not the Muslims or the Catholics or the Buddhists or anyone. Suffering arises from ignorance. More? Uh, I was just going to say, um with the peace of mind piece. Um, if one is, is like, and same thing that's um, the saying in this sutta, but it reminds me of mindfulness of the six senses um, and mindfulness of the, the characteristics of the marks of existence. So there, if, you, if one's noticing the impermanence with a wise mind of, you know, fabrications that these are, you know, that, mental fabrications and like this feeling that arises, those thoughts that arises, they're all coming from the, the, they're just arising and passing. So there's peace of mind at that point of, and like um, at that viewing gate, for lack of a better word, I <clears throat> what, what word you would say in that same kind of, um, in 
more uniform language than I'm expressing. You're doing fine. But that's where, to, um, to me, so that's where the peace of mind is. It's a wise view, right? A right view. Um, and then you can feel like the pull when you're not, there is not mindfulness at the sixth sense case. And so, and it doesn't feel very peaceful. Yes. And so and we're not attached to peace. Right? But it's, it's, it's the view that changes the experience. Yes, thank you. Peace, peace, is, peace is not a, an external quality. It's an internal, it's a quality of mind. And, it's, and it rests in internal conditions and has nothing to do with external conditions. It rests in the condition of, excuse me, of a well-concentrated mind supporting the refined mindfulness of the Eightfold Path. Just as Morris said, right view is a profound understanding of stress and suffering. And from a, a person, a human being who was con continually preoccupied with stress, and, I often say that the Buddha could have almost as accurately described the first noble truth as there is distraction as saying there is dukkha, because it is the constant preoccupation with those things that are stressful in our lives that make them increasingly stressful and keep us distracted towards them. So a well-concentrated mind is necessary so that we don't, so that we don't initially, so that we're initially able to practice restraint at this sixth sense base, as we, you know, we talk about often here, and as a Buddha is referring to. It's right here, right now. What's occurring right here, right now? It has nothing to do with what I've done in the past, and it has very really little to do with what I'm going to do in the future, except to develop the Dhamma more. Oh, I'm sorry, David. <laughs> Go back to the original discussion that the launderers had. They used the words understanding. And obviously they had wrong understanding. Yes. But they are going through their day thinking they're being peaceful and yep. helpful. But is it that they're asking the question for a wrong answer? Yeah, well, for one thing, the Buddha understands what they're practicing. You know, they're, they're in the same town, actually. So he knows who their teachers are and, and the Dharma that they're practicing. So they, they can use the term understanding, but the Buddha understands that their understanding is simply of an abstract idea that they're clinging to, rather than having the direct experience of understanding suffering. And he explains it uh, in a little bit more detail, but that is a defining characteristic, isn't it? between what the Buddha taught and really everything else is this profound understanding of the nature of suffering arising from ignorance, not just understanding suffering. Every human being, I shouldn't make you know, blanket statements, most every human being knows that they're suffering. In fact, that's the underlying motivation for most people to do things. The Buddha is not saying that you shouldn't even do those things. He's saying, but understand where suffering arises from. It's not because of the common conditions inherent in having a human life. That's the first arrow. We stick, we stick the second arrow in by reacting to what is normal, ordinary occurrences. Yeah. Is that clear? Michael. Uh, the way I understand it, okay, um, is that peace of mind arises from practicing the Dhamma moment by moment, moment by moment. Yes. It's something that is not um, longed for, desired for, that occurs when the Dhamma is practiced and adhered to and the eightfold path <laughs> is integrated. Yes. Thank you. And, and it's okay to desire to awaken. We just shouldn't be distracted by it. It's, it's, again, it's more of a a Zen-like thing now, we shouldn't want to awaken. Well, we should, that's a, that's, there's a word for it <clears throat> called Chanda, C-H-A-N-D-A, which means skillful desire. It's, a, it's an internal motivation towards awakening and that's something we should recognize and cultivate. It's, it's okay to want to awaken, it's okay to use that, in fact, it's necessary. This is why I'm going to sit this afternoon when I'm so busy. I wanna, I'm gonna go sit first because it's my intention to awaken. This is part of my practice. I'm going to go to class. I'm going to study the Dhamma. 
that's all rooted in that. Michael. Just, you know, in peace of mind, again, since we're on the topic, it's just, it's liberation. It's what? It's liberation. Yes. Yes, yeah, it's it's li but it's specific liberation, too. Thank you, Michael. It's liberation from what? <laughs> yeah, wow. That's it. We can go home now. That's it. <laughs> John, yes, Julie. Peace of mind is, is our essence, is it not? The essence, I'm, I'm, I mean, it's, a, it's the core of our being. We have to remove all the other veils of, of stress and ignorance and yes. in order to, to, to realize that that is our, that is our permanent meaning. Well, we are, thank you. And, and I wouldn't say it quite that way. There, uh, there's nothing permanent in a being. And the idea of an inner essence of something infers that and it's not something that the buddha taught there's no inner essence there's just what's occurring in this present moment and that belief that there's some kind of inner essence or a soul or a ground of being or an inner buddhahood or a buddha nature is something that the buddha continually discounted because people wanted to go there they want to establish these non-physical speculative realms for themselves because they couldn't reconcile that what is the self is just what's occurring right now made up of six properties, six properties. So the, as well concentrated and well informed as I am of the eightfold path and the Buddha's Dhamma, for me to believe that I'm simply shedding what's covering my perfect, pure inner essence is another speculative, imaginative idea, isn't it? It's not. And there doesn't, a mind that is stuck in those kind of fabrications can't even consider that there's not something of value within this six clinging, six property person, except the Buddha teaches it isn't. It, and it's irrelevant to what's occurring right now. The idea that all I have to do, just to use one example, is to, is to follow 10 commandments. And when I die, I'm going to get rewarded for following those 10 commandments for the years that you've just missed your whole life, haven't you? Doing good works, but not realizing anything. So, I don't, and I'm not picking on you. I, I'm, I'm, this is an important I, I, point. I, I, maybe, maybe I'm not saying it correctly. Yeah. I think that like, the universe is made of that, that field of, you know, of peace. Everything around us is, is that peace. You know, like if you're in space, there's that peace. Well, well, yeah, again, I don't mean to cut you off, mm -hmm. that, but that's such an a critical point. Are you in space? I think we always are in space. No, no, no. Wait, what you, where's your point of view right now? Well, right now I'm inside the body of this mortal body of yes. existence right now. That's what's important. Mm -hmm. The Buddha teaches to have a mind united with the body. We can, in, in fact, the, I, I understand what you're saying. We, out from out in space, we look back out over the, over the universe, mm -hmm. or maybe through a telescope, and all is peaceful, isn't it? But that's not reality. It's like the fabric of, the unifying fabric of everything. That's what I'm saying. But, but again, there's the speculation. I don't, I don't want to argue with you, Julia. Okay. It, no, no, it, not, it, it, may, it may or may not be true, but it's not something we can experience. Mm -hmm. And since it's not something we can experience, I can only imagine that a, a universal being is grand and peaceful and knows everything? Maybe, but it's not me. And even for me to aspire to something that I can never experience is stressful, isn't it? What the Buddha taught, and again, those, these types of things, this isn't, uh, these ideas of cosmic consciousness and universal beings is something that was just as prevalent during the Buddha's time. He studied them. Alara Kalama and Udeka Ramaputta both taught similar themes. The Buddha understood them, he mastered them, and he said, this isn't it. He didn't say it's absolutely not true. He just said it's not important. It's a distraction from understanding what it is to be a human being. And a human being is not, a human being is a human being. They're having this life. And there's no essence to it. There's no inner something. There is only the peace that comes from understanding this is what's occurring. 
So it's a, it's a, a radically different view, isn't it, Julia? And I'm not trying to burst your bubble either. You, oh, no, 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 no. I'm, try, I'm trying to understand it, actually. So good. It doesn't, it's not bursting your bubble. Yeah, it, it, it's difficult because that, this, again, the Buddha spent so much time talking about avoiding speculative non-physical establishments, which is just that, thinking that there's an inner <coughs> being, an inner soul, an inner essence. There simply isn't. It, and that's okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's difficult to, to not confuse that calm <clears throat> with this uh, idea of uh, the, grand, the grand peace and, and uh, yes. the, the unity of things. Uh, you know, it's very, very easy to, to fall into that. And, and, but still, the whole Dharma goes towards calm. Yes, and it, it, it's easy because it does, the belief makes us feel good, doesn't it? We, the, the most prevalent form of modern Buddhism is Pure Land Buddhism. And, and again, I'm greatly simplified, but basically Pure Land Buddhism teaches that if you say this one particular chant continually, and you keep that chant on your tongue, it's always there, no matter what you're doing. I used to remember what it is. But most importantly, if that chant is on your lips when you die, you'll immediately be taken to, there's different names, Tulsita Heaven or Abhidhamma Buddha Heaven. You'll immediately be taken to Abhidhamma Buddha Heaven and forever and ever, for all eternity, you'll, all your needs will be taken care of by Abhidhamma Buddha. There's, there, there's a reason why millions and millions of people believe that, isn't it? Because all you have to do is believe it and you've developed a calm and peaceful mind because you're good to go. All I got it. You know, it doesn't matter what you're doing, what the quality of your life is, what's occurring, what you understand. As long as you can keep that troubled mind away by saying this mantra over and over again, and you believe that once you die, everything is taken care of. Why wouldn't you have a calm and peaceful mind? But again, you've just lost the opportunity to awaken by believing that. I don't, I don't believe like in a heaven thing. That, 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 I, you know, I believe like we're made from like you know, the light particles that are part of the rest of the universe. Yes. So I, I don't believe that, you know, there's a heaven where you grow wings and, you know, you fly and all that. <laughs> so, uh, and you, know, you have to be good and, you know, and all, you know, that's, that's not what, that's not what I'm like, I'm not saying that. Oh, I know you're not. Oh, okay, good. Because I didn't want you to think that. <laughs> no, I don't. But, but I would also say that. That's and, like my Catholic upbringing, but that doesn't, I'm not, oh, I know. I'm not that. <laughs> yeah. It, it, that, I mean, I had trouble with that when I was a kid. But the point I'm making that, that the belief in, in a Christian heaven or a Buddhist heaven, any type of heaven, any type of non-physical existence is a speculation. And it's, it's something that Buddha can, and I hopefully do, continually teach, don't go there. Because you're only creating, you're creating a fabricated existence for yourself. What happens to people who live in fabrication? We, we we're prone to stress and suffering. One minute, <laughs> Michael. Oh, just on that, isn't that non-becoming? Just it is. Saying? That's exact. Thank you for picking it up. Again, the the, the common phrase that the Buddha would, is non-becoming. We strive for becoming and non-becoming, meaning we strive for becoming further ignorant. This is the basic teaching in a dependent origination. And we, we strive for non-becoming. What does it mean? It means just this, to imagine an establishment for ourselves that, we, that is simply just that, it's just imagination. Why would we want to live in our imagination? Because the world is too stressful otherwise. Mm -hmm. And we don't know, it's, it's speculation. Like you said before. Mm -hmm. But it works, doesn't it? <laughs> Again, the, the, the two most common forms would be Abhidhamma Buddhist, Buddhism. And the other common form is most of Mahayana and all of Mahayana and most of Theravada Buddhism, which teaches the same resolution in some type of non-physical reimagined or imagined plane of existence. It's a better product. It, it is. It's a much better product. It, it's, if, a, it's, a, it's a burst of it, something that you get at the end versus this understanding that it's a little dull and this, <laughs> this is what I got out of all this. Well, yeah. Plus, this uh, is work. I mean, this is work. This is work. Too. Yes. You have to work at living well. in a less than peaceful mind state. Um, it's so easy to forget that this is your mind state, accept it, go on. That's the, yes. And <laughs> even more so, it's, it's addressing that my views that I've created about myself are wrong views. That's the, hard, the hardest thing for any human being to do is to admit that they're wrong. We can do, you know, we get, a, get caught in a cookie jar, that's okay. But these much more subtle levels 
of what I've used, my views to establish myself in the world are so difficult because we own them, because we've joined with them. They become us. How can we let them go? The Buddha says we must let them go. Oh, wait, let me go to, to more. Well, I think I was just going to put the risk of, you know, so following on this discussion that, I think we all understand really what you're saying, right? So, and I, and that distinction, Tom, is really important. Um, but you can, I think one can experience that without having to put a fabrication on top of it. Um, so in this moment, recognizing the impermanence and the not self characteristic and the nature of you know, abandoned clinging, there is a sense of ease with what's occurring. So that's as far as one needs to go. Like, I, I think, yeah. without saying the ground of being is is peaceful, we're all connected, or not, not that you're yeah. saying we're all connected. I don't mean to cut you, but yes, all of those are speculative. So like, that's, you can just leave that piece off. All of it. <laughs> and leave it yeah. off. But, just uh, keep but integrating the Dhamma and and maybe like Michael said, like this will arise naturally. It's yes. Something that we are. And Julia brings up a good point that because we do struggle with this, mm -hmm. we do even at very subtle levels when we start understanding the Dhamma, we still might be holding on to this idea that there's something wonderful. It's not that there's something not wonderful we understand what a human being is. We're made up of four elements, the space property and the thinking property. There's nothing personal about it, but there's, there's nothing holy or sacred about it. It's up to me to make, if I'm believing in the sacred, it's up to me to make this a sacred life based on what I understand, not, be, not what I can acquire from merit or anything else like that. Peace is the sacred. Pardon me? Peace is the sacred. Peace, yeah, peace is. I mean, that's, that's but you're the natural state of a human being, an awakened human being, is peace. It's not something that's extraordinary. That's it. That's, that's it. right. And it, and that's but that's again, that's it. Took that's it took this discussion and everybody to be a yes. part of it to get to that point. Yes, that's, it. that's the point. Is is to recognize as an awakened human being, there's nothing that I should be disturbed about because I and I understand it. I, I'm not disturbed because I understand it, and that's true about anything. If we understand a situation, it, there's nothing disturbing about it. Quickly, Michael, I don't mean to cut you off, but okay. Uh, uh, what really comes through with this, I think, is that uh, this is the way I, I think. The Buddha actually was known for having such great concentration. Yep. Concentration, and like when we were talking about the subtle aspects of life, and things that arise in our mind all the time, it's like, well, how far do you go? Well, there's a disturbed mind, which is what Mara, right? It's Mara? Is that Mara, it? yes. Mara, Mara, Mara. Okay, so Mara exists. Uh, uh, so that we can recognize that uh, there is a, a process by which we uh, we concentrate down to the whatever, no matter how subtle something is uh, occurring, so we concentrate and we that concentration lead, leads us to an understanding of right and wrong thought. Okay? Mm -hmm. And you also. It, encompasses everything in the Eightfold Path, okay? And with such deep concentration, okay, uh, it's not an easy existence to be, to go through it that, that way and have such refined concentration, okay? But Buddha obviously was an exceptional being who, was, who had such uh, ability to concentrate. So I look at it as like cultivation of, of that concentration on a moment by moment, Yep. Unfolding reality, which keeps us here present in this present, makes it present, so, okay? Yes. Or being. With that concentration, and if there's a tunes in on that, we don't think about that. We don't have time to think about the past. We don't think about the future. We think about now and refining that concentration. 
yes, that, 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 that's the point of concentration within the Buddha's Dhamma. That's the point of, medit of, of why we meditate, why we have a jhana practice, because it supports the integration and the refined mindfulness of the Eightfold Path. That's why we do it. So it gets to this point. Thank you, Michael. Drop my spot now. Let me just read that again. Friends, whatever pleasure or happiness that one depends on establishing through any of these five senses is a distracting allure of sensu sensuality. Now, what is the drawback of sensuality? Here is an example. When one's occupation, distracting. <laughs> when one's occupation, whether accounting or plowing, whether training, trading goods or attending to cattle, whether archer or attending a king, Whatever one's occupation, they are subject to changing weather, to harassment by insects, to dying from thirst and hunger, and the whole mass of suffering. The Buddha is saying, no matter what your position in life, you're going to have this experience. Yeah. Somebody, more? No, 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 I'm just laughing. Oh. <laughs> dolly, dolly. <laughs> this drawback of sensuality, this mass of stress and suffering that is visible here and now, Right here, right now, this is the, again, the Buddha is pointing out at the point of contact that is visible here and now has sensuality as its source and its establishment. Simply put, the drawback of sensuality, what the Buddha is saying basically is the drawback of sensuality is sensuality. sensuality. Yeah. <laughs> and, and sensuality is different than the normal human. Uh, I'm going to get into that. I'm going to get into that. Where does sensuality occur? Where does where do, where do we where do we experience sensuality? Senses. Now, if a person gains little while striving and make an effort, they will be sorrowful and regretful. They will grieve and become destroyed. The Buddha is simply pointing out that sometimes, no matter how righteous our efforts are, no matter how much we strive, the results can be disappointing. There's no guarantee of of happiness there. But when we, when we believe so, we are setting ourselves up to be disappointed. The Buddha continues, making the quote about that person now that has put all these efforts in. All of my efforts have been useless and fruitless. As opposed to a person who engages in the world without these speculative achievements, simply recognizes... Well, this is what I did, and this is, my, this is the result of it. And they move on to the next moment. They might be disappointed in that moment, but there's nothing taken personally. And so they're free to experience it however it's occurring, rather than take a self-referential view, blame themselves, and probably blame the world or individuals for how they're feeling. Form, feeling, perceptions, mental fabrications, ongoing consciousness. Would they even be disappointed? Um, it, it depends. Disappointment is a, is a common human emotion, just like fear, just like anger. So when an awakened human being sees a bear coming out of the woods chasing them, they're going to be skillfully fearful. Fearful, yes. But... And so you'll move out of the way. Well, you might also be disappointed because it ate your lunch. <laughs> but that's you're disappointed that it ate but your lunch. Well, but but you'll also you'll move it. on and and you'll you know you'll grab another bag of nuts or whatever you have to do. It's just simply what's occurring. It's not that goddamn bear. Can't we we got to get rid of all the bears because it ate my? <laughs> I live in a world with bears. I mean, it's it's just radical acceptance. I don't need to approve that the bear chased me and ate my lunch. It's simply, in fact. It would be an interesting thing to experience it as long as you got through it. Okay. <laughs> you, you, you may not want to try that. No. <laughs> I did. I wrestled the bear one. I did. It was that I should tell the story. Now that I said it. Down in Wildwood, they had these these. You know, it was a, an attraction. If you if you I think you got ten bucks or something. No. If you agree to wrestle a bear, you get ten bucks. And I was drunk, and yeah. I could always uh, use ten bucks. Right. So I agreed to it. And it was just like it was probably about a hundred pound bear that was declawed and defanged. And the worst thing about it was that it stunk like a bear. Yeah. And I, I was a wrestler, so I could wrestle a little bit. And the bear kind of grunted and just laid on top of me. And that was the end of that. But I, I wrestled the bear. Maury, you had something to say before I passed on that. 
I, I think uh, something more that we can, I think that you, what you're pointing to and that we all can um, relate to as human beings, there's a sutra where the, I think, I think Sariputta is dying and he was a, you know, well-loved member of the mm -hmm. Sangha and the Buddha said, yes, I'm disappointed that, wow. that our beloved, the heartwood, one of the beautiful heartwoods of the Dhamma mm -hmm. is leaving us. And yes, I have understanding that this is part of the way that the human life goes. And yes, at the same time. Yeah, I always because see uh, uh, an expectation at the bottom of uh, disappointment. No, it, it, it can be, but you can also simply be disappointed about what's occurred. It, 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 again, we, I think we're getting a little bit too deep into yeah. the weeds about words. It just simply means you're a human being that you don't take anything personally. So disappointment is a is an immediate feeling or it can be an immediate feeling or it can be something that is that is stuck in the past and pushing us towards the future. Yeah. Okay. The Buddha continues, all of my efforts, just saying that again, all of my efforts have been useless and fruitless. This reaction is, the Buddha says, this reaction is also a drawback of sensuality this mass of stress and suffering that is visible here and now has sensuality as its source and its establishment. Simply put, the drawback is sensuality. The Buddha continues, if a person gains wealth while striving and making efforts, they will experience distress protecting their wealth. How can I keep my wealth from kings and thieves? How will I protect my wealth from from fire or from floods? How will I protect my wealth from greedy heirs? I'm going through that right now. Uh, even as they protect their wealth, kings and thieves make off with it. I love how kings and thieves right next to each other. Yeah. Fire and floods destroy it and greedy heirs make off with it. They then will be sorrowful and regretful. They will grieve and become distraught. What was once mine is gone. That all speaks with joining with our with phenomena and, and, and attempting to gain ownership of it. The Buddha continues, this drawback of sensuality, this mass of stress and suffering that is visible here and now has sensuality as its source and its establishment. Simply put, the drawback is sensuality. It is preoccupation with sensuality as the reason, the source, the cause, that kings quarrel with kings. Nobles quarrel with nobles, Brahmins with Brahmins, householders with householders, <coughs> parents with children, children with parents, children with siblings and friends with friends. When conflicted, they will attack. They will attack each other with fire. I'm sorry. They will attack each other with fists or sticks or clubs or knives, and they incur extreme pain or death. Here again is the drawback of sensuality. Look at the, 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 just the profundity of what the Buddha said. He's basically saying all the conflict in the world arise from this preoccupation with sensuality, with getting things that are pleasing or safe or that I need or whatever it might be, and avoiding, sensuality is also avoiding those things that are unpleasing to my senses. And we simply get caught up in it. We lose our minds and we lose our bodies. And we live our lives in, in an ideology and a fabrication of what human life should be. There is stress. Um, yes, Jay. Just to stop off at sensuality, I think it's one of the things that we're hardwired for because we're hardwired above almost everything to reproduce and sensuality, attraction. Uh, yep. And so I'm not sure that they can see things the way we do, you know. Who's they? Point, the, the people in the Buddhist time. Oh, that's, he's, making the, he's, he's making the point that that is the difference. They can, we can see it and they can't, basically. Mm -hmm. And again, coming back to that, we can't avoid sensuality as human beings. That's what I'm saying. Just but what we can what learn is to practice restraint. That's the whole point of the Dhamma. It doesn't that, well, we're sensual beings and so we're lost. We, the, the, the brilliance of the Buddha is he understood a human being so well that the original vehicle for our suffering is the same vehicle we take control of it to end our suffering and it all occurs with the way we think so there's nothing right or wrong about sensuality 
it, when we engage with our own human sensuality with a mind rooted in ignorance, it can only increase stress and suffering. So again, the things that are sensually pleasing, it's not that they're bad, it's that we join with them, we, we cling to them, rather than live life in an impersonal way. So you brought up a great point. Jay. Did that bring a little clarity just, as well? Just meant to be a footnote that you know there are things about being a person that are speculative, and there are things that are pretty obvious. And you know, sensuality, sex, reproduction, all very central to our experience. And when you to, well, to our some but of these politicians you hear about who are chasing young women all the time and stuff. Well, then it's aberrant behavior, and some you would maybe be avoiding. But the basic well, it can't be avoided by people that are doing it or they, would, they wouldn't do it. Right. They're doing it because their minds are rooted in, you can say, well, they're perverts, but that doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't even describe the problem, does it? It describes the actions. The problem is ignorance. Although it's more than that because it can also be that there's a chemical imbalance in the brain. That could and be. That, yeah. And that's why that behavior is... Uh, there could be. But, <laughs> but the, 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 the general the point here... Even if it's, it's interesting when people talk about sensuality and not this is I'm not singling you out. Most of the time we're thinking about sex when we hear the word, right? No. Sensuality, sex. That's only one thing, one aspect of it. And, and people, people live very well, by the way, without sex. It's not a requirement for a, for a happy human life. A lot of people would, Masters and Johnson would probably hang me if they're still around. But, but people with it, with the right, mental framework you can practice restraint at anything it doesn't mean that sex is bad either by the way but it should be practiced with restraint shouldn't it and it should be i don't want to get too deep well we're, we're, we we are gonna i'm gonna start re we gotta we gotta cut down a little bit on the commentary whenever we're gonna get through this so may, may, yeah and after that let's keep it till we go around the room more so it seems to me though very specifically in this sutta when the buddha is saying sensuality he is very specifically just referring to the six sense basis yeah so but we uh, confuse I'm, so, I'm sorry that's what i tried to say before sensuality has an idea yes they are the same thing if you looked it up in the western dictionary but we think of sensuality as silks and and this and and being this sensuality means what's coming in and if there's mindfulness of the six sense basis you understand it with wisdom <clears throat> what's coming in so it you can still experience the pleasure but you understand it. so that's all i'm getting at Thank you, Mark. you know it is preoccupation with sensuality as the reason the source the cause that human beings wear armor use swords spears and arrows while changing charging in formation into battle with other human beings so the, the, why do we have war the buddha just taught us why we have war with spears and arrows flying with swords flashing, they are wounded, their heads cut off, ensuring extreme pain and death. Here again is the drawback of sensuality. This mass of stress and suffering that is visible here and now has sensuality as its source and its establishment. Simply put, the drawback is sensuality. Friends, it is preoccupation with sensuality as the reason, the source, the cause that human beings take what is not theirs, they ambush others, they commit adultery, and when caught, kings have, have them tortured for their misdeeds. They are, they are flogged and beaten with clubs, their hands and feet cut off, the ears and noses too. They are subjected to many indignities and deprivations. Here again, this is the drawback of sensuality. This mass of stress and suffering that is visible here and now has sensuality as its source and its establishment. Simply put, the drawback is sensuality. Friends, it is preoccupation with sensuality as the reason, the source, the cause that human beings engage in bodily, verbal, and mental misconduct. Having lived the lives as such upon death, this is so important, having lived the lives as such upon death and the breakup of the body, there was only continued deprivation. So you think the Buddha is talking about another life? Continued deprivation? No. Yes, no? No. 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 What is he referring to then? Body well, just uh, it starts to rot and decay. Okay. That's it. That's it. And so people have taken that one line and say, "Oh, the Buddha's teaching reincarnation." 
the, and he describes it too in many suits. There's a deprivation of a, a body just laying out there is picked apart <coughs> by animals, et cetera, and it slowly dis 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 decomposes and it oozes all kinds of unpleasant things. That's a deprivation that even upon death, it continues. You're not getting away from it. And if you have <laughs> self-identified with that body, the thought of your body going through that is troubling, isn't it? When the truth of the matter is, that's just as impersonal as your entire physical life was. Just an important teaching on that. Mm -hmm. Here again is the drawback of sensuality, this mass of stress and suffering that is now only continued deprivation that has sensuality as its source and its establishment. Simply put, the drawback is sensuality. And again, this is just occurring within a person's mind, but the Buddha sees is identifying that as troubling. Why? Because it's a fabricated view. And what, friends, is the release from sensuality? The subduing of passion for sensuality. That's the Dhamma, those two lines. The subduing of passion for sensuality. Excuse me. The subduing of craving for sensuality. The abandoning of passion for sensuality the abandoning of craving for sensuality. This is the release from sensuality. So again, there's nothing ambiguous about what the Buddha is teaching. Friends, I say to you, any contemplatives or Brahmins who do not understand sensuality as it truly is, who do not understand the allure as allure, who do not understand the drawback as drawback, who do not understand the release from sensuality as release, could only understand sensuality or rouse in others in accordance with what they believe and what they practice. So some people get upset when I say, if you're going to be a Dhamma teacher, teach the Dhamma because to do things to do otherwise is cruel. And that's what the Buddha was saying 2,600 years ago. We don't need his words to say, to understand that. But to mislead people in Dhamma practice, I think is the cruelest thing anybody can do. <clears throat> As release could only understand sensuality or arouse in others in accordance with what they believe and what they practice it is impossible for them to understand sensuality as sensuality. Because what you're teaching is, is rooted in using your senses to reaffirm your own ignorance. But friends, I say to you, any contemplatives or Brahmins who do understand sensuality as it truly is, who understands the allure as allure, who understands the drawback as drawback, who understand the release from sensuality as release would themselves understand sensuality and rouse understanding in others in accordance with what they believe. In other words, in accordance with the Dhamma and what they practice. <clears throat> it is now possible for them to understand sensuality as sensuality. It all depends on what we're practicing. That's uh, part one. We'll finish this on Tuesday. But that's enough for one day, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, let's go around the room. You, see you, Brett. Thank you for the help with the debris and all that stuff, too. I'll see you next week. Good morning, Jen. Hi, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I think in this sutta, the Buddha is sort of pointing at sensuality as the problem. And when you're listening to that with a mind that is rooted in ignorance, you might immediately kind of jump on sensuality as the enemy. Yep. And say to yourself, now I need to just, just get rid of sensuality and everything will be fine. If I could just get rid of sensuality and then the mind starts reeling against sensuality and becoming averse to sensuality and saying, oh, well, how can I get rid of sensuality? Like, that's part of my hard wiring. And how do I, you know, and then we get into this argument about what sensuality is and how do you define sensuality? And that's an example of just getting lost. The Buddha isn't saying get rid of sensuality. No, not at He's all. He's just saying, see it, recognize it, and don't become obsessed by it. Yes, be informed through your senses at a, from a mind resting in wisdom, not ignorance. When you see sensuality, if you notice yourself becoming averse to it, or you notice yourself becoming craving after it, 
Yes. And recognize that. And where we where do we know it? In in the form, in the body. And a mind that it that is reacting is going to be felt in the body. Notice that. Realize this is not me, this is not mine. Take a breath and go into the next moment. Mm -hmm. a meaning avoid any type of ascetic practice completely. Remember the Buddha practiced all these severe ascetic practices, which which is <clears throat> still practiced today. That well, the problem in this misunderstanding of the well, the problem is sensuality and craving. So if I just cut off my senses, that's mm -hmm. the answer. That's asceticism. That's a, and it's still going on in very severe ways. But there, there's many um, aspects of asceticism that have become the fabric of. We don't do silent retreats for that reason. That's a form of asceticism. That forced silence for long periods of time is just that. And it's nothing else. People make excuses for it. But anytime you deny the senses, and in fact, you're really denying three senses when you decide to not speak for a period of time. And there's no Dhamma there. There's no opportunity for it. But it, and it's even deeper than that. Think of the, the strategies that we do because we don't understand something. We don't understand our sensuality. We, we, we feel like we're, and many people are, are out of control as far as their sensory input is. So the solution is not to understand it. The solution is to cut it off. It doesn't work, does it? Whether, you, whether you're a drug addict or an alcoholic or somebody who's just craving Cheetos. Craving Cheetos, Cheetos or craving endless idle conversations. So you're always on the phone or on, I mean, that, it's the same addiction, isn't it? And it's the need for, it's a need for distraction right here, right now. I cannot stand the quality of my mind. I need something to distract me from it. And that's what we do. There's so much self-loathing in that, that whole notion, but it's simply because we don't understand who we are, that we're driven to these, these extreme practices. So thank you, Jen. Right. Lorna. Um, thank you for your teaching. I'm sitting on the side. <laughs> I'm glad you're here today. <laughs> well, let me get to Mary. Mary, how are you? Uh, I need to... Can you Hi, unmute? Hi, there you are. How are you, Mary? Good, good. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> um, somewhere you said something about... Um, uh, that this is active, not passive. And um, that kind of stayed with me as <coughs> um, beneficial to, to an understanding the subtleties of today's Sutta. Um, you know, that even restraint is active and oh, yeah. uh, at, at managing everything at the sixth sense base where the suffering occurs is active and it, it also speaks to you know this is not an easy practice uh it may appear passive on the outside but it's it's very active and so it, we're leaning in to um become excuse me become more aware of the subtlety of what's happening at the sixth, ba sixth sense base and that's a very active process i guess that's what i had <laughs> thank you thank you mary it's so important um the word karma means action again very misunderstood in modern buddhism but that points directly to the uh acting to awaken meaning using what's occurring right now the present moment unfolding is my karma and if I'm acting within the framework of the Eightfold Path, I'm taking a positive, not a, that's the wrong word, oh, positive. I'm taking a, a intentionally motivational direction in where I'm going. I'm acting in it. That, that, again, that's, that's the difference between even something that Julia brought up earlier, the, the establishing myself in some kind of speculative, imaginative realm is passive, isn't it? It's just occurred in my imagination I guess there's some action there, but it's, it's completely passive. I'm not doing anything that's going to have any realistic effect on me. The Buddha, everything we do within the Dhamma is significant in that if it's framed by the Eightfold Path, it will have the effect that we hope it has. I'm going to go to Ram first just because you've got to leave. Uh, so 
going to have a conversation on dukkha, and the first thing that comes up is sensuality. And, uh, points again that dukkha also occurs right at the sixth sense gate. Yep. And, and this is also where, where it ends. Mm. Yep. And who's in control of that? I don't mean to interrupt you, but because I know you're going to have a good answer. Who's in control of the sixth sense base? We are. Yeah. yeah. And, and this is where restraint, you know, the, the, the control is restraint at yeah. the sixth sense base. This is the end of, uh, this is the end of Dukkha. Yep. As simple as that. It is that simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Tim. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Um, every time I read the sutta, I, uh, it's like an, it, this is the attack on the on, on the self on the ego and um <laughs> and we saw that response today i think um and, and rightly so um the the dharma teaches for me the guidelines the proper steps to take when confronted with these sensual take care of my these sensual things whether it's sight sound taste what have you you and I have talked about this before. I really like science a lot. I but do I too, need, by the way. Despite I mean, our no, conversation. But, but I need to use, and I do, uh, the framework to keep it in line because we all need to stop time traveling. And what I mean by that, yeah, that's right. It, a distracted mind really is time traveling. Yep. Whether it's in the past or in the future, even two minutes in the future, what I'm going to do. And to keep it right here, those distractions will leave. And the ego, the self, wants to plan, wants, wants to put these things in neat little pockets. And when we don't have those pockets answered, that's the danger of salvific things coming forward. And yeah. when we talk about what happens to us when we die, you know, the ego cannot fathom this ending, <laughs> this thing called ten ending. Yeah. <laughs> the thing that Buddha is saying is we just, we don't know. So there's no reason to even worry about it. There's no reason to think about it. There's no reason to even go into the past to try to figure it out. You'll get there. Yeah. And then it's the most practical teaching ever. And that's it. Yeah. And that six that that suit is within that that this 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 the sixth sense base there is is basically saying all those things is that we're like very detached from nature we're very detached from our environment as humans more you know even in the Buddhist time we we we're really we're in a building we're not outside we're not part of the flow and that is a struggle that's a struggle that the that the yeah. self has and so we're trying to figure all that out so this sutta to me uh, I, I read over and over and over again because uh, it brings me perspective all the time and mm -hmm. keeps me focused on the eightfold path because I, I i think unless i'm correct please tell me if i'm not getting this buddha was just saying just stay on that path. <laughs> it was saying just that so, Thank you. It, it, again, it, it, I emphasize it because the Buddha emphasized it. It's this path. It's nothing else. This is what we do, and this is why we do it, and this is what we look for. And it, it's nothing beyond that, you know. And, and uh, you said something else I want to comment on, but I forgot it. But <laughs> thank you. Good morning, Lisa. Good morning, John. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for asking. Always good to be here, and just my mind feels like it's exploding with all the different ideas, although it's just a lot of things that are said in different ways. Yeah. Uh, which is good. You keep repeating things and then something gets through and said in just the right way that uh, different people can understand. Um, you have mentioned s several times uh, about the word sensuality uh, referring to the five senses and 
consciousness, the sixth wonder, the thinking. Um, so it encompasses all that. It seems like people, okay, so people have this tendency to want to avoid bad things, and they have another tendency to be, to want to go after um, things that are going to satisfy one of their senses, or several of them, and not wanting that to end, which is not acceptance of the reality of life. Mm -hmm. um, and just it's and some of it is seems frantic in our society. Yeah. And uh, and thoughtless. Yep. Or another word for that is mindless. Uh, but, and, and then also knowing, like what you said about, you know, decomposition of living things and, and, and all that, because we're covered in the largest organ in the body, which is the skin. But, you know, it's covering up like all the icky weird things that are always going on yeah. inside and and it is it's 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 kind of like <coughs> i don't know how to describe this is that you know we walk around and not only you know do we not even want to know kind of what's going on inside like i don't want to think about that Ugh. <laughs> you know um but even things on our skin so people cover themselves in all these beautiful clothes to deny their, what's like denying their humanity. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, a king wearing a crown and it, it's just pretending to be something you're not. Um, but, but, but the thing about that we, you know, we go after beauty and we admire things, but uh, the moonflower, uh, obviously it's, it's wilted. If you could see that happen before your very eyes. So at, at, at eight o'clock, it was cut and it was per perfect and beautiful. It doesn't last long anyway, but when you cut it, um, already by the time we got here, it had you know, started to change. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that, that's what happens to it. It just shrivels up and curls up and nothing is not, there's still beauty in it, but you know, kind of not the same thing. And I think that's just, that's the way things are. We need to accept that. I think food is the same. There's nothing wrong with, you know, admiring and loving, but it's gonna pass. It's not always going to be that way, and just enjoy it for what it is, and then go on. I like what you said about uh, that. Um, the thinking or something is about uh, time time travel because you're when you when you daydream, you're always whatever. You come back and say, "Oh, I was thinking about what I hoped was going to happen," or or mulling over something that could happen before instead of just being right here. Because if you're if you're there or they are, then you're not living. It's not, I think Buddha wanted us to just live. And not say, I can't wait till. You know, people say, I just can't wait till, and then fill in the blank. Well, yeah, thank so, you. So it's, you're, <laughs> well, then you're wasting your now. You're wasting your life. That, thank you. That That's the essence of a conditioned mind, to think that, you know, I, I'm always time traveling. I'm either in the past or the future. The Buddha taught a Dhamma to unite the mind in its body and keep it there. Why? Because that's the only way we can live a life is to actually be here for our life. Right? We got to be in our body. We got to be mindful of what's occurring. And we can't do that if we're time traveling, if we're, if we're stuck in the past, that this was a better experience yesterday, or I hope that tomorrow I get even prettier flowers, whatever it might be we've lost our mind, even if it's a pleasant thought, even if it's a loving thought. If it's not in our body at the moment, if it's not relating to what's occurring, we've lost our mind. 
in there is stress. It's not right, wrong, right or wrong. If we're concerned about understanding stress as a Buddha teaches, we understand that we're out of our minds now. Let's regain it. That's the ultimate stressor is not being in your mind. Good morning, David. Good morning, Lauren. I think I said enough and I appreciate everyone's um, thoughts and comments. And I think thoughts and comments are helpful. To I think so, that. too. It's really what sets this Sangha apart. So yeah. glad you're here. Good morning, Julia. Good morning, John. Um, thank you very much for the, the, the teaching of the Buddha and your, teaching, your way of presenting it. <laughs> thank you. Morning, Michael. Good morning, John. I'll just say this quickly. I didn't mean to get people, I, I, I just meant we need to know, know, keep I the feel, class going. <laughs> no, we, you, you, everybody who's spoken has contributed greatly to our class, as always. So, thank you. I'll just, you know, boy, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. I always do. <laughs> and I've learned from it, so. Um, it doesn't matter what situation we're in, where we are, anything that we encounter. Everything, again, unfolds moment by moment, whether it's here, uh, at home, uh, in public, at an event, wherever. Okay? Whatever occurs is going to occur. So when it does occur, and no matter, again, the, the magnitude of it, again, doesn't even matter if it's of uh, uh, great or, or, or lesser. What to do then, in my interpretation of this, you remain, you remain in deep concentration, or you refine your concentration, okay, through meditation and practicing of the Dhamma, living the Dhamma. And no matter what unfolds and occurs, we, we respond to that moment. Framed, you know, within the framework of the eightfold path. That will, uh, which is something that once you understand the Eightfold Path, it becomes more of a natural thing to do. And you don't even have to exercise as much restraint. The more integrated you become with the Eightfold Path, although there always will be a moment of restraint, the right action comes forward. It flows from you. Doing so, Operating from there, as life unfolds and occurs, um, it creates this slow process of liberation that we're freeing our mind, freeing our, we're freeing our mind of ignorance. Yep. And again, just ending there. Um, again, no. Let's make no no doubt about this. This dhamma, okay, the Buddha dhamma is not an easy path. Mm. It's, a, it's a path of deep concentration. And again, um, that, um, that, that occurs with the unfolding of every moment and occurrence that we encounter. Mm. Wow, beautifully said, Michael. Uh, there's nothing I would change for that. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, except maybe that it, it, is, it is a difficult path. Um, but it's much easier than living in ignorance. Very true, very true. You know, it, it, we're, we're so familiar and actually we get a mind that's, that's enamored with its own thoughts is a very lazy mind. And there's a lot of examples of that today. You know, people with really good minds, but they're lazy in their thinking. So they keep creating stress for themselves and others. That's it, you know. So it, it, another a counter to a lazy mind is a well-concentrated mind because the more concentrated the mind is, and the more it's trained by the Eightfold Path, the more useful and skillful its thoughts are. So this underlying conversation that we all have, thoughts are always flowing, are now rooted in wisdom. And so they're producing results that are rooted in wisdom in the moment. This is how the Dhamma works. And it's just that way. Thank you. Morning, Kevin. Good to see you this morning. Good to see you. Thank you so much for speaking. And thanks to everybody for their yeah. wise and insightful and uh, I just wanted to add, it is in the future, but I want to wish you a great <laughs> retreat next weekend. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. We're going to miss you I'm not being there. Miss it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, well, I'll talk about that in a second. Glad you're here.
Good morning, Jay. Good, good morning. And we have been all over the universe today, you know, lots of things. And mm. I want to thank everybody. Thank you, John, for the mental stimulation because it's a rare thing nowadays. And I'm not in an academic environment where people are philosophizing or, or, or parsing the bits of reality and humanity every day, but uh, it's a treat. It's, it's, it's a little bit of a tune-up coming here, and you know, like, wow. <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. So, it was a good day. It was. I'm glad you joined us. Good morning, Mary. Um, it's great to be here again. Um, your teachings are always so beneficial to me. They ratchet me down and you know, ground <laughs> me again, and, and very helpful. I'm glad you were here. Um, so we'll we'll finish this talk on the Maha Dukkha Kanda Sutta on Tuesday. There will not be a class next Saturday, but the next Sutta on Dukkha, the Kula Dukkha Kanda Sutta, will be next Tuesday and Saturday too. So, uh, it's a um, remarkable series of three talks on this heart of the matter that resolves as we started this study, within the self. Everything the Buddha taught is experienced and resolved within the self. There's nothing external um, that can act on us, and there's nothing external that will act on us. It's all up to us. That is such a liberating uh, thought to truly understand. It's all up to us how we experience this life. The experiences of life aren't up to us, many of them, but our experience of that is entirely up to us. We can maintain a calm and peaceful mind rooted in understanding, or we can continue to lose our minds, even if it's in very subtle, comfortable, familiar ways. It doesn't really matter. So, thank you for a wonderful class. We'll finish with um, Meta as we always do. And there's still some room on the retreat. If anybody wants to join us, please do so. And these are the words on Meta from the Karaniya Meta Sutta from the Buddha. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings. Radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Thank you all for a wonderful class this morning. Peace. Thank you, Mary, for joining. Bye, John. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs>